week after week, you know, excellent speakers on subjects of interest to us. And uh, there are subjects which are of special interest to us senior citizens. One of them is uh, Ayurveda. Uh, a lot of us do go to Ayurvedic doctors in addition to Western medicine, or what it's called allopathic doctors. But we don't know very much about the alternative systems of medicine and the alternative approaches and the uh, way in which they can be integrated and the way that we, we could rely on one or the other with assurance. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion on that, but to be able to hear about that from an authority like, like Dr. Patwardhan is a great fortune. And uh, I'd like to welcome him on behalf of all of us at Arthasri. And I'd like to welcome also the other members. Our circle is widening and we are getting people from other uh, associations also to join us. Maybe the numbers are small, but it's widening. So welcome once again. And uh, let me request um, our own member, Dr. Lavkare, to formally introduce Dr. Patwardhan. Dr. Lavkare. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja, Mr. Raja. Uh, you know, first of all, Bhushan, I want to tell you that uh, the job of introducing you uh, has been given to me, and I'm going to take a very different turn. Your bio data has been circulated. And that by data, therefore, I'm not going to read it. Uh, more importantly, I, people want to know as a person, who is this Bhushan Patwardhan? And in, in doing so, you come closer to us. That is the reason they asked me, uh, since I happen to know you for almost uh, 20 years now. So please excuse me if I miss out on some of your academic achievements. But I want to assure you that all those details which you sent us, People have gathered and uh, looked at those. So I will not go into the details, except uh, while passing, mention some of those of your, of your achievements. Uh, so friends of, from Atashi and uh, uh, other participants, uh, let me uh, start introducing you, Bhushan Parfus, as a person, the way I know him. I first met this young man uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, at a committee which was set up by UGC. And um, the subject was a very interesting subject and uh, the area of which we then worked on is slowly getting into the new education policy. Not exactly in the way we wanted it, but uh, it was basically the committee was on promoting Indian higher education abroad. How Indian education can be promoted and Indian students can be exposed to study abroad. So that was the broad thing where I first met Bhushan Patwardhan. And uh, there's a little incident, very interesting incident. Bhushan was to come and make a proposal at that meeting. And the chairman of this meeting uh, was unfortunately not able to come on that day. A very, very well-known expert who somehow couldn't make it that day. So I was the senior most academician there. So they asked me to chair the meeting. And I refused to chair it. I said, uh, if Bhushan has to say something, then let him lead the discussion and let him chair that meeting. And then this was, in a way, giving a challenge to look at Bhushan. How is he as a leader? And sure enough, my confidence in him proved to be right because uh, the way he conducted the meeting and the way he has a methodology of work and the detailing and the way he bring, takes everybody along with him is something which I've always admired. And over these years, I've seen him grow. This young botanist whom I saw, as I said, 20 years ago, was over the years grown to be now, today, is a vice chairman UGC, and is also uh, the chairman of the Indian Council of Social Science Research. And I just learned that he has also now got a new position in the Niti Aayog, and he's going to talk about it in terms of his, uh, uh, his presentation. Uh, but the point is, uh, being a professor normally at Pune University, the tendency is to stay put in your chair, have your, 20, have your students, we have PhD, write a few papers, but Bhushan was not one of those. Bhushan was the one who enjoyed meeting people, enjoyed visiting institutions, enjoyed doing new things and new places. And that's what really made him 
different from an ordinary professor at a university. And this uh, experience of his, of interacting with people, took him to places where, not only in India, but abroad, where he was always welcome, either inviting to speaker or staying, spending some time doing research and so on. And he has been to different institutions within the country and the outside as well, which is something which I always consider a unique quality of an Indian professor. Now, as I said, uh, when I saw his enthusiasm and I knew that this person is going to go places, and sure he did. Over the years and in a very, very short time, uh, starting as a botanist, he soon became a chairman of this department, set, set up a center for health science. Then uh, slowly he got outside the university. He became a vice chancellor of a university. Then uh, the opportunities came for vice chairman UGC. He became, got selected and so on. And you know, one thing which I always enjoyed is that uh, in Bhushan, and maybe I should be proud of that, that I was always honored that whenever Bhushan got a new offer or a new position, he would consult me. And we would have long discussions, the pros and cons, this is good, this is bad, should I do it, should I not, and so on. And this always sort of made me happy that I was able to help a young budding uh, leader uh, coming out of the academic community, out into the real world of education and, and development issues. So that uh, really is... Uh, uh, something which I, I, I enjoyed uh, doing it. And uh, these long discussions made me understand Bhushan much more than simply as a person of a professor of a university. His uh, ethical standards were very high. It's a position which he thought was not the right one, where the ethics were not correct. He would not take it, he would leave it. And I would mention, but some of the positions he relinquished but mainly high positions he relinquished were mainly because of his commitment to the ethics of the academic community. And that really raised my respect for Bhushan more so because he stuck to his uh, ethics and principles uh, on which to work in. And uh, that is something which uh, I, I feel uh, uh, something which has given me the joy. And therefore, when, I, when uh, Mr. Raja asked me to get a speaker and of a subject, See, look at this, a botanist now going into Ayurveda, integrative medicine. It's not just uh, looking at plants and classifying them and toxicology and so on. You're very interested in very different things. And that's what uh, I enjoy. Uh, when people diversify from their field, uh, it's something which I even tell my young students. Don't stick to your uh, books and uh, syllabus and things like that. Get out into the real world. And that's what Bhushan has done. So I'm, uh, I'm sure he's going to tell you more about his achievements in each of these areas. But uh, I thought I will uh, mention this. So, Anbharat, you would be happy to know that uh, uh, Bhushan is an environmentalist. And uh, in a sense, just like you, he also used to go, I don't know whether he does that now in Delhi, but in Pune, he used to bicycle to his department. Oh, day. very good. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew that would touch a chord in you, uh, Bharat. So uh, that's what, uh, in fact, he. In Pune, this was a little unusual, and uh, his photograph appeared in the newspaper saying that he rides his bicycle, this okay. professor goes to school, and so on. And in India, it is a little unusual. We know it's in the US, it's quite common, <laughs> but in India, it's quite new, and uh, Bhushan set the trend for We that. will set the trend. We will set the trend, <laughs> for sure. Now, in all these achievements of Bhushan, I must say that uh, he was always uh, supported by his wife, Bhagita. Uh, Bhagita is, uh, on, on, has her own merits and uh, since she's an entrepreneur and she is, uh, uh, does design and garment and exports them. She works very closely and uh, I was happy to see her. I don't know Bhagita very well, but I know her achievements through Bhushan because Bhushan was always proud of what Bhagita did. So, uh, as I said, Bhagita herself is an entrepreneur and those are the qualities which both of them enjoyed together. And so they are so also their daughters. They have two daughters. Both of them studied in the US. One is in architecture, the other was in pharmacy. And all of them are professionally doing very well. So I'm very happy to see this family going into academics and broadly en enhancing their areas of work, areas of research, and areas of commitment to the society. So with those words, I think I would uh, uh, leave the audience to judge Mr. Bhushan, but for them, 
uh, on his own in terms of how he has, uh, how he will convince you of the new areas of work which he is still doing. Uh, okay, Bhushan, thank you very much. And uh, pardon me if I have said something which I should not have, but that's the freedom I had to take. And th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raja. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laukare. And uh, uh, it's such a, a pleasure to uh, be here with all of you and the unusual, very unique way, uh, in typical Dr. Laukare way, you have introduced me. Uh, that was also an introduction to me as well, you know, of myself, <laughs> because I went into the uh, nostalgia and uh, memories uh, of the past. I remembered our first meeting uh, at the UGC of that committee. Uh, uh, friends, first let me uh, thank all of you, you know, and I'm amazed to see uh, the enthusiasm uh, and the organized uh, uh, teamwork that is happening in Athashri uh, group. And I must tell you that from this year, I have joined your club. I have become a pensioner. So <laughs> although I still continue to work in the UGC because uh, uh, in Pune University, the retirement age is 60, but UGC it is 65. Uh, but typically, I've started my pension from Maharashtra. So I am a pensioner now. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, consider now uh, uh, me as one of you and not uh, as what Dr. Laukare told you as a young boy, which uh, he, she, he saw a couple of years ago. You know? uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I also, uh, while he was introducing my family, I must tell you that I come from a very... Uh, the middle class family uh, from Pune. Uh, and I grew up in an environment, we had a joint family in Pune. You know? So 24 people staying together, eating in one kitchen. So I did not know what do you mean by cousin brother. We did not know, not only I, nobody knew what is cousin brother. Brother is brother, sister is sister. You know, so this is the environment in which uh, we all uh, grew up. And just because of the uh, physical limitations of this uh, space and all, everybody uh, was separated out. But essentially, that's the background uh, I came from. And in my family, you know, uh, I had seen several Ayurvedic uh, methods, treatments, simple medicines being used by my auntie, by my grandmother. And that always had interested me that why... Uh, such simple things also can help us. You know, that was in my mind. And when I went for my biochemistry, I did my biochemistry uh, with Professor John Barnabas. Uh, and uh, later on, I did PhD and postdoctorate at uh, Hafkin Institute. Uh, but uh, that was in my mind. So right from the uh, my master's dissertation, I decided that I will work on something related to Ayurveda and Indian knowledge systems. Uh, and... Uh, at that time, most of my friends, you know, they were going to protein chemistry, enzymology. Uh, that time, genetics was just coming up. Molecular biology was on the horizon. Uh, so, but uh, uh, Professor Barnabas actually encouraged me. He said that, no, if you want to do this in... Well, otherwise, people were laughing at me. What is this? You know, you are a biochemist and doing this jadpala, jadpati, and uh, what are you trying to do? Uh, but then, uh, because of the encouragement at that time uh, uh, from many, you know, I could uh, do that. And as Professor uh, Laukare uh, told you, uh, from that modest beginning, I still continue to learn even today. Uh, uh, I have uh, 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 let me. Uh, I have a actually presentation, so I was in two minds whether to use uh, PowerPoint or not. Uh, but what I'll do is I will use them sparingly. I want to talk less and I want to engage with you in discussions more. So I will uh, uh, complete my talk in a shorter duration of time than you may have uh, given me the uh, slot and leave more time. Uh, for discussion, that's what. So I may not talk uh, in detail on each of the uh, slide, but th those slides will bring some questions in your mind and we can return back to those questions and expand that more uh, based on the levels of interest. You know, So uh, uh, that's what I will start sharing the slides and uh, uh, let me see now if you are able to see the slides. 
So yeah. I, I was suggested that I should talk on uh, Ayurveda and integrative medicine. And uh, uh, I have added one more word to that, you know. And I have added Ayurveda and integrative health and medicine. And health and medicine, as I go along, you will realize that why I have added this term uh, health uh, when I was supposed to talk only on medicine. Uh, health and medicine, especially in India, I have seen, we have been using these terms as synonyms, you know, which they are not. Uh, often health is equated with medicine and considered as a commodity, you know, which is to be acquired through medicines and healthcare. And that... Uh, impact on our mind is so much that we have started believing that by taking medicines we will get health, you know, which is not possible. Health is a positive and dynamic concept and uh, health is natural phenomena where disease is an invited trouble. You know. The roots of illnesses are actually can go back to maternal health. What your mother and father might have done, that impacts on your health today. You know. So the malnutrition or the environmental pollutants and toxin can have impact right from your early days when you are uh, not even born, since that time, the impact of all this starts happening in, on your health. A serious diseases like hypertension, coronary heart diseases, stroke, obesity, cancers, may have roots actually uh, in the uh, first 40 weeks of pregnancy and uh, uh, fetal origin of uh, adulthood diseases has become a major uh, research area now. With this, uh, I want to ask this question that what is health? WHO defines health as a physical, mental and social well-being uh, and not just merely absence of a disease. But is this definition complete? To me, this definition is not complete. You know, Because what do you mean by well-being? Can you measure well-being? One of the principles of management you know, because I also, when I was in Bangalore, by the way, I have got very good memories of Bangalore. I spent uh, three years of my life in Bangalore, uh, first with Manipal Group and then with uh, uh, FRLST uh, in Yalahanka, now known as Transdisciplinary University, founded by Darshan Shankar. You know. So, uh, uh, so I have uh, great memories of Bangalore. Uh, so during uh, that time, you know, I uh, 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 this. Uh, uh, State of physical, mental, I, I also did, uh, I am Bangalore executive management program. So I studied some bits and pieces of management where I learned that we can manage those things which we can measure. So my question is, can we measure well-being? But we don't know what well-being is. We can't uh, measure well-being because simply we just don't know. So if in a definition, if something is there which you don't know or you can't measure, obviously you can't manage it. So physical, mental, and social well-being, although WHO talks about, actually it is not possible for us to monitor. The second part of the definition is absence of disease. Now here comes the crux, you know. Disease can be measured. Deformity can be measured. And therefore the whole focus of WHO definition became on disease. So you will see that our entire health care process, we may call it as health care, but in reality, if you see, it is medical care. It is not really health care. I will expand on it a little later, but let me tell you that the most profound definition of health and health also by uh, etymologically, uh, the term health also is connected with disease. Heal, if you are trying to heal something, that means you have some problem. But the definition of swasthya, which is given in Ayurveda, is much profound. Swasthya, swastha, swayamme swastha, that's the swastha, you know. Internally within, you are calm. Internally within, you are stable. You know? And the definition says that samadhatu, samadni, samadosha, uh, and prasanna atmendriya mana. Prasanna, that is bliss. Atma, indriya, and mana. At all levels, if you are stable, within, internally, swast, then you are healthy. I have not seen such a profound definition anywhere in the world. Because even if you go by WHO definition, physical, mental, and social, uh, social are not the only level, spiritual level, which is equally important, which is completely missing today from the WHO definition. So health, for, by the way, health has always taken a backseat. You know. Disease-centric curative approach has roots in education as well the health sciences universities for that matter. I keep on asking this question that where is health in health sciences university? 
what do health sciences university offer mbbs bms bhms physiotherapy all treatment where is health in it so we have been really uh, confusing uh, between health and healthcare and i want to ask this question today are we really giving healthcare the care is about primary healthcare the care is about family medicine the care is about prevention the care is about promotion are we doing this or are we really totally dominated by the cure aspect you know which is hospitals which is drugs which is medicine which is diagnostics or actually we are moving into health care because to me we are actually scaring people we are in the business of scaring people look at this advertisement which i have put this is a regular advertisement in the newspaper you may have seen the question is asked are you having a blood sugar you know high blood sugar and then the picture is shown of a person maybe undergoing amputation and all so it is and look at the prescription which is on the screen if you are able to see this is a real prescription and there is a data in us that senior citizen in the us on an average is prescribed 8 to 10 medicines now are you eating medicines as food no the uh, the approach should be if you have food as medicine you don't require really are there any other medicine if you become if your food becomes a medicine that's the uh, thing which charak said and which also hippocrates said you know but we have completely forgotten that actually our health is in our hand and that's the ayurveda and yoga way you know our we have completely undermined our own capability to heal ourselves there is internal capacity within us to heal ourselves and ayurveda and yoga show you the way how to do it and therefore ayurveda and yoga is not to be reduced to any pathy or any medicine they are much more than that so health i think is very precious to be outsourced to doctors and hospitals health should be in our own hands people need simple ways to achieve health and prevent diseases people need healthy diet healthy lifestyle mental peace and relaxation the new integrative approach which i am talking about involves corrective surgeries or emergency measures which can be drawn from allopathy and holistic concepts mental health prevention which is drawn from ayurveda and yoga and other such pathies you know ayurveda if you see and we have actually done this study you know what ayurveda is so ayurveda there are three types of interventions which ayurveda gives physiological interventions pharmacological interventions and psychological interventions in allopathy primarily you will be giving only pharmacological interventions drug based interventions you know physiological interventions now because of covid they are coming like wearing mask is one of the physiological intervention you know because you are not giving any medicine but in ayurveda the extent of physiological and psychological interventions is much more than pharmacological or medical intervention this is the beauty of ayurveda and yoga that it talks about the whole it talk takes a look at your own personality your own prakriti type and based on that treatment comes in you know this is typically a personalized medicine now i am coming to why integration you know those who are interested i had given the link to my book which i have written to dr mutali who is in now usa at age of 92 he is still active with me on daily basis we still keep on De deliberating and uh, writing several things so he was professor of medicine uh, in india then he became director of medical ed education and research and then he retired as uh, uh, director of who uh, uh, new york office you know so very eminent physician uh, so this book those who are interested can have a look at it uh, but uh, uh, essentially uh, in integration i am saying that we need to transit as a country from our existing pathy based approach which is silos actually pathy allopathy and ayurveda they will not look eye to eye you know and we have created a caste system within this medicine that allopathy is a higher caste and others are lower caste you no know, there is no need for that you know because every pathy so called pathy has some strengths some weaknesses because allopathy may be able to handle better emergency care or uh, emergency medicine or surgery as against yoga can manage better mental health condition or ayurveda can manage better chronic diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis so everything it should be person centric and not pathy centric that is the uh, way but today we are in a curative 
practice you know which is dominated by market forces and therefore to, today we have been drawn into what we call it as medicalized society we are actually living in medicalized society so many a times the policies of big countries also are decided not by the only politicians but by the industries who govern them so this is a major problem which is being faced in many countries and on one side whether the, uh, while scientific level of evidence is going up because we know that science and technology is advancing and therefore levels of scientific uh, evidence is going up and up no doubt about it but on the other hand the level of ethics is coming down which is very very worrying and if you are tracking what is happening especially in healthcare industry the kind of ethics issues which are coming up are really worrying whether it is pharmaceutical industry or whether it is healthcare and hospital industry you know? Uh, uh, if i want to tell you that what are the real needs and uh, the real services required for healthcare then look at this pyramid the base of the pyramid of needs is family and community health family medicine and community health second tier of this pyramid is primary healthcare the third need is secondary medical care and the fourth need which is of course important which comes to super specialty is tertiary medical care you know so this is the need but the proportion levels if you see at the apex level tertiary medical care comes in but the reality in service is actually opposite of this pyramid the majority contribution coming to family and community health are from ayush and traditional health systems which is at the bottom of the pyramid at that low end of the pyramid you know public health care you know primary health care can be given by both some care can be given by allopathy some care can be given by ayush secondary care may be predominantly by allopathy and tertiary care even more predominantly by allopathy but now you look at the budget of national national budget if you see india's budget the budget for health and family welfare ministry is something like 69000 crores and if you look at the budget of uh, ministry of ayush it is minuscule if you are able to read it you know just hardly 3% of this main budget and as it is the proportion of health budget which we hope that should go to 6% is hardly 1.4% of the gdp so you can imagine the status of healthcare industry healthcare scenario in our own country with these uh, self speaking uh, figures you know then why integration integration essentially as i told you is from pathy based to the indian scenario if you see the doctor population ratio we always say that it is very low in india but i will tell you it is not it is low in india because we are not considering almost half of the proportion of doctors which come from ayush sector we are not considering them at all you know and if you look at this uh, uh, slide you know 20 lakh medical doctors in india if you see only 11 lakhs are allopathic remaining are ayush doctors if you go to any top level uh, medical hospital the front level doctors whom you may meet they may not be mbbs they may be homeopathic they may be ayurvedic you know they are being used as a cheap labor by the industry and the allopathic colleges or ayurvedic uh, ayush colleges are unfortunately being used as a backdoor entry to allopathic practice but this is detriment this is detrimental for the scholarship this is detrimental for the practice and this is detrimental for india also and this is detrimental for people so now what do you want to do if you want to say health guardians is the main role of doctors and that's what i believe i think doctor's role is not to prescribe you drug or diagnose you know doctor's role should be essentially as your health guardians are we really treating doctors or are doctors positioning themselves as health guardians we have to think about it you know but people of india what do they need if we ask this question people of india need four things the first important thing people need is primary care second is family medicine third is this is diagnosis and prevention and fourth is public health now what is the motivation of medical students is their motivation to give all these people needs no i don't think so today motivation of mbbs doctor is to become md 
So MBBS doctor is all the time busy in thinking how he or she can get admission into MD. MD doctor wants to become MS or MCH or super specialist, you know. And the motivation of BMS doctor many times could be allopathic practice. Eleven states in India have allowed allopathic talk, doctor, allopathic practice by Ayush practitioners, you know, which is very very strange, you know, because you are not trained in that. So why you, we are creating these kinds of uh, silos and this kind of a uh, 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 oil and water system when people requirement is completely different than what you are trying to give. So let me come to uh, uh, the main crux, you know. What is the basic purpose of medical education in India? If you ask me, basic purpose of medical education of India is primary care and family medicine. Now, where are those family physicians? Many of you must be remembering your own family physician. I remember my family physician. My family physician used to know my entire family. And we had so much of confidence uh, in them that the counseling that he or she may be giving it to us itself used to cure us. That was the authority of that family medicine. And then he or she used to refer us for a specialist. But today, MD people are behaving as if they have become a general practitioner. So this kind of, a, uh, uh, I would say, value chain, which is going up in the cost, is not sustainable for country like India. We must control many things at the primary level. And to do that, determinants of health must be addressed very, very carefully. And which are these determinants of health? There are only four determinants of health. Major determinants of health are four. And they are genetics, environment, lifestyle, and nutrition. Out of these four, barring genetics, all three are in our hands, you know. We can decide whether to go on the right track or wrong track. If you go on eating bad food, if you are go on having drugs, if you go on uh, having uh, junk food, you are bound to get into trouble. And then you need some support system. These are four pillars of a building. And if any one pillar becomes weak, you need a support system in the building. That support system is a medical care which I've shown in that red round, you know. But our entire focus of the building has become now on that support system. And we have forgotten the real peers of the, uh, pillars of the health. So we have to rediscover that. And this has been our own culture. I'm not talking something different. India has been talking about all the time and leaders in, uh, uh, in these concepts have been Ayurveda and Yoga, you know, which we have unfortunately lost because of that Western dominance and monopolization of Western medicine in our country, which is good, which is needed, but it has its own place. So today, the gullible patients are trapped into this vicious circle, which you can see on the screen. This circle is of hospitals, of insurance companies, of diagnostic labs, of practitioners, of doctors, and within them, there is a very, very interesting relationship uh, uh, which I have shown, which you may not see, but the arrows you which you see on the screen uh, are showing the relationship of this vicious circle. You know. But the WHO actually tells us that the whole of society approach should be used when you are talking about uh, healthcare, when you are talking about public health, you know, uh, it includes health promotion, disease prevention, uh, uh, treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care. Where all this we are teaching in our medical schools, our MBBS and BAMS put together, if you take, they come to 82% of our medical doctors. Are they trained in the requirements, what people need? The answer straightforward is no. They are missing somewhere. Somewhere they are missing. There is no uh, complete medical education which we are giving to them today. So can our aspiration be in a direction to one nation, one health system by year 2030? This is a question I'm putting forward. Can we move from pathy-based to person-centered approach in health? Can we convert Ayush, which stands for Ayurveda, uh, Yoga, Yunani, Siddha, Homeopathy, it also includes naturopathy and Sovarikpa. Can we convert that Ayush acronym into Ayush by adding one more A, and that A will be of allopathy, and that allopathy A will come after Ayurveda A, because Indian healthcare system, I think, should be stemmed on Indian culture, Indian knowledge, Indian ethos. 
without bringing in any egos you know can this be a achievable dream that is the question i want to leave to all of you i know many of you may be retired doctors as well trained from top medical schools many of you may have served in pharmaceutical companies so what i talked about the professions is not to undermine their importance because i come from that sector itself you know but it is a matter of introspection and to ensure that we must deliver what people need and we should not get trapped into our own egos and get engaged only in protecting our turfs that's the thing we need to think and introspect so with this i would like to thank you and say namaste and i also want to really uh, appreciate the uh, the spirit and the energy levels which i could see uh, uh, when i am on this uh, group of athashri uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, i think i will stop the presentation so you will be able to see uh, thank you if there is time depending on whatever time you have we will be spending on interaction thank you, you. keep this evening free so yeah. i don't yeah. have to worry about it <laughs> is of, uh, your interest and your time thank you thank you very much dr parshwardhan you have uh, really raised a number of questions which have been in our minds for a long time and i'm sure which have been in the minds of all our members and uh, they would they have noted the points that you have Uh, made i'm sure and some of those questions probably they will put back to you francis now one of the things that i have myself uh, experienced is what you said about the family uh, physician now i was in bombay for a long time for about 30 years and i had the good fortune of having a family physician whom i could ring up at 3 o'clock in the morning if i wanted and who knew everything about every member of my family now such physicians have disappeared altogether from bombay they are not available anymore and we are in the hands of specialists and there is as you said as you indicated there is a there is a fear there is a fear lurking in the minds of most of us that we are scared we are uh, controlled we are manipulated by the drug companies and uh, manufacturers of medical devices and maybe private hospitals at whose mercy we are uh, that that sort of apprehension that we have now um, how, how do we get out of this and how do we integrate uh, the two for instance particularly in areas where there is a there is a clear uh, conflict between the practices of ayurveda or the conventional uh, medicines and of allopathic medicine for instance i went to an ayurvedic doctor who gave me a medicine for my knee pain and later when i went to my specialist he said oh no 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 don't take any ayurvedic medicine please stop it immediately it contains metals it may contain zinc or it may contain lead or something please stop it now when a doctor tells me that i naturally get worried now in such cases Uh, what does the ordinary person do? How do we? Because we don't have any hamuk, I mean, pharmacopoeia yeah. knowledge to sort of assess for ourselves what is good for us. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you for that question. I will answer it into two parts. One is what can be done now, and second, what can be, uh, what should be done for future. Now, now the question you asked, you know, now that situation is happening because the Ayurvedic doctors are not. having any kind of a knowledge of modern drugs which are needed for uh, primary care or allopathic doctors they don't have any knowledge about ayurveda and this is the root cause of all this is in education we are making specializations too early you know in china if you see the basic medical graduate of china has knowledge from both the sides they have knowledge from traditional chinese medicine and they have knowledge from allopathy so that they are able to handle primary care i am just talking about primary care and believe me 80% of your problems can be taken care at the primary level you know so you need specialist and super specialist but that is at the top of the pyramid you know at primary care uh, the basic doctor must have 
what people need so if we are able to really uh, create their uh, minds shape their minds at the basic medical education level this problem can be resolved uh, i think currently uh, we have no definite answer because this are so oil and water based that it is futile actually to me to convince allopathic doctor no ayurveda is safe ayurveda is good or to tell uh, ayurvedic uh, doctor you know that uh, you should actually consider for immediate relief no if you have a severe knee pain you know you can't wait to do yoga practices you know to get relief you know you have to have immediate uh, pain killer you know you you need immediate relief so that kind of a approach and that's what i'm talking about integration whatever is best available keeping patient at the center and not your pathy as the need you should be able to do that and that is the real service to people and you you should not serve to your own pathy you should serve to people because ultimately doctors by oath they are committed to their patients okay thank you uh, let me throw this open for discussion uh, would any of our members like to join raise any points because dr patrudan has raised a number of points number of questions let's have a discussion uh, let me just step in for a minute uh, i have allowed the participants to unmute themselves but i'm going to request everybody to stay muted do not anyone who would like to button. please come in uh, can send a chat just, message to yeah and also use the chat message or they can even talk uh, yeah uh, yeah okay uh, unmute yourselves and go ahead Dr. Patwadan, uh, my name is Shankar. I'm calling from Chennai. Yes. Uh, current day lifestyle is such that we are adopting only a curative approach to medicine and not a preventive approach to health. That's for sure. Be it from an ordinary cold or a fever, right up to Alzheimer's or whatever it is, the common man reacts to an ailment having set in and looks for. gunshot therapy immediate treatment which is widely believed to be available only with allopathy ayurveda is a very ancient thing in our country even far be before uh, uh, allopathy uh, made its scene but not withstanding that it hasn't grown beyond a certain point i have some practical uh, reasons for it because i have also been Uh, uh, I, I have been a pharmaceutical manufacturer, allopathic pharmaceutical manufacturer. I have uh, had certain allergies which got cured only by Ayurveda. It didn't get cured by the allopathic uh, medicines. And I have also been thinking along these lines. But the fact remains that why am I not? Even I would say, even the people in this audience, if they have an ailment, they will go. first to a allopathic doctor only ayurveda comes way behind in the queue one reason also is the fact that there is no insurance coverage now unless and until the ayurvedic industry also gets money by whatever research or anything may be coming in unless and until there are enough patients backing the industry the uh, ayurvedic industry hence its own research we have if you look at the compendia or the or the encyclopedia there is a huge fund of knowledge available but in terms of application and the utility it it doesn't really count that is that is a matter of fact i had a, a, a problem of skin allergy which lasted me 16 years before i could find out what it was eventually it was just due to the usage of tamarind and when I, I stopped tamarind in the year 1990. Now 30 years, I don't have any allergies, but it took me that kind of time and treatment with haldi and this and that. So many things I've done. What I'm trying to say is the Ayurvedic industry also needs to be encouraged by the citizenry, and that is possible only if the government and the insurance agents come and say, "Okay, if you spend on Ayurvedic thing, we will reimburse you." Yeah. So that is one inhibition. You go there to the Ayurvedic medicine. You buy two thousand rupees of medicine. You can't claim any reimbursement. So somebody has to work on that side also with regard to encouraging the Ayurvedic industry, or because something which is handed down to us from over five thousand years, whereas allopathy has just stepped in recently, 
but it has swept away the market so how does one deal with it at the administrative level over and above whatever technical study or research or cure etc etc no oh, very very uh, uh, profound question you have asked you know and i agree with you and uh, uh, see and i i when i say exploitation exploitation is not done only by allopathy or pharmaceutical uh, companies you know exploitation uh, and tall claims also come from ayush sector and we have been actually talking about it you know because ayurveda or for that matter any traditional system cannot sustain or grow uh based on self pride and past glory we have to realize that we are in today uh, uh, world of science which is progressing and greek medicine became allopathy because they went along with the modern science while ayurveda was suppressed at that time that time our people priority was just to protect knowledge and therefore it was stagnated so now because of the uh, efforts of uh, uh, scientists like dr valiathan uh, and many others you know there is lot of research happening in ayurveda but your question is uh, uh, how do we why people are really uh, preferring and going that is because quick fix in our mind uh, we have been bombarded uh, with a fact that you can get help by taking medicine that's what i mentioned when i mentioned medicalized society you know the kind of prescriptions uh, which uh, uh, you are getting not only in india but all over is really worrying you don't need those medicines you know you do you need medicines but you don't need those kinds of medicines because if you are able to take care of your own habits your own food if your own lifestyle you know several things can be like you eliminated uh, uh, imli from your uh, uh, diet and you became all right so some uh, guardian of health we need you know to look after our own health we can look after our own health with help of that kind of a guardian so we need to create that uh, cadre again which we have lost a cadre of family physician uh, a, a, a cadre of uh, a primary care uh, which we have lost and give them glamour unless and until you give a glamour uh, and sufficient returns why people will go to family medicine they are not going to family medicine because they don't see future there so all these things we have to consider and at a policy level and that's why uh, that's what we are trying to do at the niti ayog niti ayog has appointed a committee uh, to consider whether there is a possibility of moving in a direction of one nation one health system by 2030 and this one health system is not one health system per se one health system meaning the integrated health system which is centered towards people's need so we should be able to give what people need and whoever can give that should be able to and should be allowed to give that you know so keep people at the center this is what uh, this uh, discussion uh, we are uh, trying to do and uh, the beginning of that i personally feel that should start from medical education because at the medical education level like china has done if you are able to equate if you are able to bring this equalizing effect at the basic medical education level then allopathic doctors or ayurvedic doctors will have bare essential knowledge required for primary care or to take care of family health and once that happens you know automatically many of the problems will get resolved for immediate things there are efforts from minister of ayush uh, to resolve this insurance issue in bangalore itself there is a chain of hospitals run by uh, uh rajiv vasudevan called ayurvaidya and you will find that excellent evidence based integrative treatment of ayurveda is given in those hospitals and insurance coverage also is given now because rajiv himself is a iim graduate he become entrepreneur but rajiv has done this great job of bringing in insurance uh, also for ayurvedic sector so slowly things are happening but the irony is in our own country our own knowledge systems are not given uh, forget about importance or priority they are not even given recognition uh, or even ear to hear that is the problem right thank you any others i'm sure there will be add a question please unmute yourself if you wish to hello good evening my name is vinay call uh, dr hello. patwardhan i have a question to ask you 
what specific recommendations would you make to restore uh, the uh, the uh, the and create this family physician uh, that existed and as a guardian of health as you said what are the measures or recommendations to bring this back both in terms of policy in education or any other infrastructure uh, thank you, Mr. Call. Very important question. That question is under debate now, and you also can contribute how it can be done. Because ultimately, it has to emerge through a consensus. And we are currently in the process of consultations and getting suggestions from people how we can do that. No. So, uh, the family physician uh, system can be gained back if we are able to motivate current medical graduates to go into family physician profession. They can go that if you are able to make that profession more lucrative, more prestigious uh, by giving government uh, some kind of a uh, support and uh, some kind of a recognition. You know, people should feel proud that I am a family physician as they feel proud that they are MD uh, general physician. They should be even feel prouder that they are family physician and that kind of a respect because doctors typically in Indian culture are looked at the level of God, you know, we treat them on par with God. So that yes. kind of status we are giving them. So family physicians again can regain that, you know, society can give them that stature. But the education system, the reward system, the governance has to devise and that's what the discussion we have started. I hope it will uh, come uh, very soon, but the beginning of that will happen at the education level. So just one more question. Yesterday, the National Medical Commission has formally been announced uh, its uh, structure uh, into four uh, distinct boards. Will this National Medical Commission bring in some features that would restore uh, the integrated approach to Ayush and, uh, and allopathic medicine? Yes, we hope so. But I must admit that the uh, effort is not easy. It is extremely hard effort. It is easy to do this integration in America, I would tell you. America already is doing it. Top okay. medical schools in the US are actually, and top medical schools and universities even in the Europe, you know, are teaching courses in Ayurveda and Yoga. But our allopathic medical colleges to make them teach Ayurveda and Yoga is a big effort. So there is a mindset change which is necessary, which we are trying to do. We are trying to engage them, you know, and there are very progressive modern medicine physicians like I told you, Dr. Valiathan or Dr. R.D. Lele uh, or Dr. Ashok Vaidya, uh, B.M. Hegde. These are the champions of this cause, you know. They are there, Dr. Mutali. Yeah. So uh, we, we are really trying to move in that direction. I hope it will happen. The National Medi uh, Medical Council, uh, what you are mentioning to, uh, the National Health Policy 2016 has actually for the first time boldly talked about integrative approach. And not only health policy, the new education policy. If you read National Education Policy 2020, I was so yes. happy to read that. I must compliment Dr. Kasturi Randan. I was told that he was also here uh, with all of you at one point of time. Yes, Dr. Kasturi yes, Randan, that's right. When I interacted with him, you know, he agreed to my suggestion, you know, that integrative approach is necessary. Darshan Shankar, myself, many of us, we made this presentation before his committee and you will see a full paragraph that in India, Ayush doctors should know modern uh, pharmacology and modern doctors should know Ayurveda and yoga. This is what the clear cut message has come in the policy. So I see a very good environment today. So 2030, that's the uh, hope and aspiration we have put, I think with help of uh, many of you, you know, this should be possible. And this is not only about government here. Because this has to be, this has to become people's movement. Because this is need of the people. This is based on need of the people. Everybody uh, 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 agrees to this principle that they are not interested whether the doctor is allopathy, whether the doctor is giving allopathic medicine or what. They want to get healthy. You know, that is their primary need. And this, yes, will happen. Yes. this will happen. So let's continue. By the way, for the first time on a so-called public platform, I am discussing about this Niti Ayo because this is very, very fresh. It has not yet been talked about. I was uh, uh, a little hesitant whether I should talk about it or not because uh, uh, this is still at a too preliminary stage. But then I thought that all of you 
come with such a wisdom and such an experience you know so your suggestions and your responses will help us to move ahead in the right direction thank you thank thank you very much doctor thank you so thank much you. thank you uh, yes i have a question anyone else yeah yeah mr raja i have a question yeah please go ahead. Uh, bhushan how would you put uh, homeopathy in comparison with uh, ayurveda purely to get at the scientific content of the two areas of the two disciplines of uh, yeah uh, yeah dr kalakar it's a very uh, a difficult question to answer for many reasons you know the first reason is uh, as a person coming from science uh, i am not able to understand uh, that science and talking about anything which i don't understand i feel that it is not scientific for me to comment on you know but i have seen at the same time homeopathic medicines working on several people very well but i don't know how they function i really don't know and i have also seen extreme critics of homeopathy you know who say that you should put a label on homeopathic medicine uh, that it will work only if you believe so i i don't know it is very difficult but as long as people believe in it as long as people get benefit from it homeopathy is a great uh, uh, aid i would say because it is economical it is very simple to take the science of it the evidence of it we we'll have to really work it out and see what is to be done but at least uh, to me uh, i would say that uh, if the safety levels are well established and i think they are uh, where is the harm if somebody wants to take it would it for yeah. part of the integrative medicine i can't hear you well uh, i don't know yeah. would, it form, would it form part of an integrative medicine approach see integrative medicine approach doesn't exclude uh, anything so whatever is needed for people and whatever is beneficial for people it should be brought in so we are not uh, in inti- the uh, word integrative itself you cannot be selective it has to be evidence based so evidence based integration is key not just faith based integration or not just emotion based in- integration or not just uh, 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 intention based in- uh, integration it is evidence based in- uh, integration Thank you. Right. Any other questions? Anyone else? So, uh, Mr. Raja, I'd yeah, like to yeah. jump in just briefly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, you mentioned more than one portion. You know, you've come from a science background, and and I know you have pers- you have done personally a lot of research work and on on uh, Ayurveda formulations. Uh, I, uh, I I suspect that uh, one of the reasons why Ayurveda is not so big and people think immediately of allopathy, besides all the commercial pressures and all that, is what you just said earlier that uh, we don't seem to have a full scientific understanding of Ayurveda. Those were not the exact words, but you made the analogy with Greek medicine become allopathy. Uh, personally, for me. i would say that that's the reason i don't have faith in ayurveda only because i would like to see a greater study of it done before i plunge in so what i would like from you is some description of what efforts are being made uh, across india or anywhere across the world for that matter to put ayurveda into a solid scientific foundation no no very very good and thanks for this question uh, i will answer it uh, in two parts again the first part about evidence in ayurveda now uh, let me tell you that uh, and i have studied this evidence based medicine to get great detail you know that's why i'm telling you sure the notion of evidence in science also is evolving continuously uh, and uh, evidence based medicine today this term itself in modern medicine and modern science is being debated to a great extent because you will read uh, there is a, a very very uh, eminent scientist uh, known as john eonides you know he is director of stanford school uh, called matrix and he is more in meta analysis and uh, uh, high uh, level research uh, in medicine 
So he had published a series of article in Lancet in which he showed that 85% of biomedical research today is waste, is not reproducible. So what kind of evidence we are talking about? Second point I want to make is the clinical trial results which are in public domain, many of them people have shown counterly that many of them are not reproducible. Third, evidence, absence of evidence cannot be equated with evidence of absence. So I completely agree with you that Ayurvedic fraternity must come out with evidence. But my question to you also as a scientist, which I ask myself, who should do that research? Can we ask those Ayurvedic pundits this question that what research you are doing? Those poor people have protected this knowledge. It is the onus of modern scientists to look at Ayurveda and do a scientific research to take scientific leadership for India in the world. And uh, that's what is possible. I will give you my own example, a very small example. You know, In year 2000, I hypothesized that Ayurvedic concept of Prakriti is personalized medicine. And remember at that time, 2000, Human Genome Project was just emerging. It was not completed. Personalized medicine was not the buzzword at that time. You know, At that time, I published an article with this hypothesis in a journal. And I said that Ayurvedic concept of Prakriti is a way to go to personalized medicine because Ayurvedic Vaidya looks at you as an individual and based on your Prakriti type, the intervention will differ. So many people with different Prakriti with same symptoms may get different medicines. That is the basis of customized or personalized medicine, which is genomic medicine also what is now known as you know personalized medicine. So this hypothesis, I thought that I must check as a scientist. So that time we were working on rheumatoid arthritis. So we had a cohort of patients of rheumatoid arthritis. In modern science, we very well know there is a gene called HLA-DRP1 gene. And that gene relationship with rheumatoid arthritis is very well known in modern science. So we looked at gene polymorphism, taking that one gene. In 2004, I am talking about. And we were completely shaken up. This was a blind study of 76 subjects. 76 patients of rheumatoid arthritis, we did their DNA analysis and we did their uh, HLA-DRB1 gene polymorphism. And in the blind study, we showed that wath pith cuff classes had different distribution of alleles of this gene. For the first time, we could get the genotype-phenotype correlationship, which even today, modern genetics is struggling. And then from that small study, which happened in a very small laboratory of mine in Pune University with the first uh, PCR in the university, we did that study in 2003. My Kal Kalpana Joshi, my colleague, uh, did that study. And Dr. Arvind Chopra, rheumatologist, actually provided us clinical samples. You know, We presented those results at Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Pharmacogenomics in 2005. And later on, it was published in International Journal. Today, CSIR alone has funded more than 100 crores and a new science has emerged, which is known as IU Genomics. Now, this has given a scientific leadership from, for India. Now, imagine the knowledge points which we may get from yoga and Ayurveda, which others don't know. Our problem in India today is if somebody invents something, you know, we go back to our Sanskrit Grantha and we tell them that we know it for 5,000 years ago. Now, what we should do is we should go to those Granthas and find out those gems which today's science do not know, work on it today and tell the world, this is what it is you did not know and we have shown this. There is no point in telling. It is good that you are telling that. And I have seen that. Last four year Nobel Prizes in Medicine and Physiology. Every prize work, what you have talked about in those medal, everything is based on the basic principles of either Ayurveda or yoga. Maybe it is based on the concept of fasting, or maybe it is based on the concept of Rutucharya and Dinacharya or chronology, chronobiology. You know? But then telling that later doesn't mean anything. You know? 
May it means hardly anything. It means definitely good. It gives us satisfaction and pride. But as I told you, we should not live now onwards on self pride and past glory. Those days are over. This India is new India. Indian scientists should boldly work on these concepts. And I must tell you that it is happening already yeah. in many IITs, in many IIMs, yeah, not IIMs, IIMs. And in many national laboratories of CSIR and ICMR, people, young students, young researchers are working on basic concepts of Ayurveda, basic concepts of yoga, looking at what meditation is doing your brain, what are the uh, MRLA uh, scans uh, before and after. All this is happening. But India must expedite on that track. Otherwise, this leadership, Westerners again will take because the most advanced research in this area which is cognitive sciences or neurobiology based on yogic principles is happening outside. It is happening in India at a very small level. So Indian scientists, I would say, must take this ownership and try to see, and we are not telling that go in pseudosciences. I will be the first one to oppose that. You know, We are not talking about that. We are not talking about what we were doing, uh, flying aeroplanes or whatever. You, we may be doing it show us you know, today and that kind of a evidence-based approach if we are able to take with these knowledge pearls which are there in our own knowledge system now in china medical students learn chinese history medical students learn chinese culture medical students learn chinese traditional medicine why not our students even know so they are coming out of allopathic medical schools with hatred towards our own medical systems you know, this is not really good for our own country. So my point was, uh, scientific research is necessary, but we should not put that blame only on Ayush fraternity. We also should participate in that to take that further. No, thank, I, what, you. thank you, thank you. No, what you're saying uh, m mostly is music, and I, I, I personally agree with you that it is a science fraternity that needs to go in and put everything on solid foundation. What I really wanted to, sorry, I didn't question that. Uh, what I wanted to know was to, what sorts of efforts are being made. But there is a companion, which, which you partially answered, or I mean, it's more a matter of time. I'm sure you can answer Yeah, more. the genetic study, what I talked about is just one example. Yeah, there are several such studies. Uh, my own study uh, with my own uh, rheumatoid arthritis colleague groups, Arvind Chopra, uh, we have shown that Ayurvedic interventions work very well on par with hydroxychloroquine and with much safer profile. And this was a double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial which was published in British Medical Journal. So a lot of efforts are happening. Evidence is getting up, but we have to do much more. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Patwardhan, is there any medical uh, college in India which teaches something about Ayurveda, something of Ayurveda, meditation or yoga? Alternatively, any Ayurvedic um, college which uh, you know teaches the basics of uh, the Western. Yeah, fortunately, Ayurvedic many research. Ayurvedic colleges are teaching now modern pharmacology because their students want to practice uh, in in short. But uh, so they are doing it. You know, uh, many of them in Ayurvedic colleges uh, they learn modern biology uh, or modern anatomy and modern physiology as well. But I don't know. Uh, maybe some private schools may be doing it at a very small level, uh, you know, but yoga to some extent has come in, uh, you know, like in AIMS also now, but it has more at a research level. In medical schools, research is happening related to Ayurveda and yoga, like Dr. Sharadini Danukar started it in Mumbai yes. KEM or uh, uh, Darshan Shankar himself here, or even in NCBS, yes. many people are working on uh, yes. neurobiology in NC NCBS, you know, or in TIFR, uh, many people are working uh, on understanding uh, various biological processes. Uh, uh, Dr. Valiathan's program, which he calls it Ayurvedic Biology, has given a big boost. But formal course on Ayurveda and yoga, I have not seen in any medical school because they are essentially governed at the top level by MCI. So unless MCI gives permission for that purpose, this will not happen. So we are trying to really sort out that by engaging uh, this National Medical Council and by bringing MCI also on board, you know, engaging with them 
and uh, bringing this kind of a equalizing effect without compromising the rigor you know that is the most important thing yeah, yeah. thank you i think uh, isn't uh, nimhans doing something we had talk here in a conversation Yes. Uh, Nimans doing something in yoga and no, Nimans, Nimans, Nimans has introduced one course, but which is more on yoga. And Nimans itself is mental health, so it is very. Uh, current director of Nimans, uh, Dr. Gangadhar, B. N. Gangadhar, is he one of the very good yoga. researcher in yoga. So it is because of his own interest and efforts of persons like Dr. Nagendra from Bangalore. You know, this has happened. In uh, uh, so they have created a module on integrative medicine as well. Uh, at nimas but their more focus is on uh, yoga uh, and to some extent maybe small extent ayurveda as well but these are uh, small but good encouraging examples yeah dr kangadhar did come here as a speaker okay. in our conversation series but well, i must tell you that for example university of milan mm -hmm. in italy is giving course formal course for their mbbs doctors course on ayurveda and yoga wow wow or uh, harvard university you know has a osher school of integrative medicine university of california at san francisco has a osher school of integrative medicine wherein even at undergraduate level a module on integrative medicine is given wherein ayurveda and yoga are part so it is happening more outside Wonderful. india has to really open up you know we are yes. a, 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 we Uh, we have to rediscover our own knowledge and try to really, uh, if not give respect, at least some recognition and uh, say that they exist. At least you know, <laughs> we are even refusing their existence today uh, in our own country. Thank you very much, Dr. Patwardhan. It's been a real pleasure having you, and uh, we covered so much during these during this one hour, and you made it made it very interactive so that. a number of us could participate and come out with the concerns that we had in our minds uh, thank you very thank much you, indeed thank you and i hope my mentor dr laukare uh, uh, is satisfied <laughs> with this because the uh, insistence i came and talk to you you know you all are uh, so senior and so distinguished people you know it was a pleasure to get now you are one of us now and we are <laughs> for the day when you will come into authorship street as we as a member we have had a virtual <laughs> meeting you would like a real meeting sometime <laughs> yeah, yeah i hope now so. uh, may i request our athashian shankar ramanaya who joined us from chennai in fact shankar was in the discussion with the first very first question may i request shankar to propose a formal vote but thanks. i also want to say that i am so amazed to see Uh, even now, 29 people out of uh, some 31 uh, or 32 joined. Almost all of them are here. Uh, you know, so that shows yes. the yes. Uh, level of interest of your group. Yes. You know, so I'm very happy yes. to be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shankar. Would you please unmute yourself? Uh, I deem it a great uh, privilege to be able to propose. Uh, formal word of thanks uh, i just wanted to add one sentence that at the end of the day everything comes down to commerce and marketing airlines would not survive without passengers railways will not survive without passengers ipl will not survive the spectators any kind of uh, activity which needs funding and when the, the take away is that uh, what dr patrodan said evidence based that to generate that evidence to create that evidence and to create awareness it is all a big marketing game people should be able to back this particular industry or uh, let us say this particular subject and for that how does the uh, what are the proposals to create the interest and awareness in the person to follow so if the evidence is available yes i'll get uh, treated well i'll get cured well i'm sure i'll go to ayurvedic uh, say and this applies to most people anyway i just wanted to say this and uh, close on but uh, first and foremost let me thank dr uh, uh, bhushan patwardhan for this wonderful presentation in fact uh, although there was a powerpoint stuff but most of it was extempore and all the facts and figures that he brought out shows what kind of a repertoire of information he is on the subject and uh, we wish that uh, he just doesn't retire but continues and uh, 
to generate uh, real interest among all the uh, public uh, we, we have we are a 1.3 billion market will be so it should happen at some stage or the other i thank uh, mr raja and mr bharat for having once again come up with some excellent uh, program and all the, to all the other members who raised their questions i have one one last uh, uh, request to all of you you know the uh, idea of one nation one health system which i triggered moving from pathy based to uh, holistic healthcare you know if you agree to that in principle i would appreciate if you put yes in your chat box you know so i know what is the consensus you may put no also you know so whatever it is so if we get a voting done uh, on this uh, uh, so i know generally how people are taking this concept you know which is very important uh, for us to take it ahead on the spot thank you thank you rather we could do that yeah would you like us to do it right now no no you can do it later also you, okay. you can compile everything and just okay. let me know you know okay so, okay thank right. you thank you Thank, thank you very you. much sir thank you thank very you. much thank you namaste thank you namaste namaste and this meeting comes to an end bharat thank you yeah. thank you everybody i'm going to stop the meeting thank you all